Gaza somewhere that I have worked before and I knew that things were going to be different obviously coming back this time. But I have to say that it was still a, a massive shock to, to cross at uh, Rafa and immediately to find ourselves encircled by people looking in the cars to see if we were bringing food or, or water. Finding the streets of Rafa just absolutely full of people, building shelters, these camps and these fields with these sort of shelters of fortune made out of this thin, almost transparent plastic sheeting. Just, yeah, this massive overwhelming sensation of how desperate things have become here after uh, two and a bit months of war. One of the big problems here in Gaza is that as so many people have been wounded that the hospitals are chaotic. The hospital is not really a hospital anymore, I would say. It's more like a camp. The, the, the place is just filled with, with people uh, milling around, trying to sleep, trying to find a corner to make their own, trying to find something to eat, to drink. So when people are coming in, they're literally kneeling in the blood on the floor to try to save the life of the person, putting in a chest tube, even intubating on the floor, which is just really, really extreme. So many people told me about the loss of, of relatives and sometimes just an incredibly long list of, of people that they'd lost uh, in Israeli airstrikes. I think the sentiment is really for many people that I've talked to that Gaza's gone basically, there's, there's nothing left. And it's difficult for them to see a life here again. It's very, very sad. I'm at the Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunis. It's a city in the south of the Gaza Strip that's been the focus of Israeli ground operations for the last few weeks. Outside the hospital, you can hear the bombs and the shells landing not too far away. And inside the hospital, the results. And when you look at the register of patients in the hospital, what you see is a solid block, one single cause of injury, explosive injury. We've got two OTs that we're working in here. In one at the moment, a 12-year-old girl with a gaping wound on her right hip. She's crying, she's distressed. And in the next OT, a guy, perhaps 25, his left leg amputated, his other leg fractured with a metal external fixator drilled into the bones, keep it in place. One thing I want to talk about is the dedication of the Palestinian colleagues. Most of them, they came here on October 7th and they haven't left. And the scenes that they described, especially in the first month of the war, just absolutely apocalyptic. Bodies torn into hundreds of pieces, burned by the force of the explosions. It's really horrible. There's one story that stuck with me. A woman we were operating on had fourth degree burns all down the front of her body. That means that she was burned right down to the fat. All the skin had gone off. And she was burned so badly because one of her children caught fire after an explosion through a bombing and in order to try and pat out the flames on a child's body she hugged the child to her and in the process was so badly burned herself. We slept there all together, had dinner there last night. This morning we woke up with the Anis Nippers turning on the radio, hearing about what's been going on in the world. The team in Nasser Hospital saw leaflets that had been dropped by the Israeli army on the area, calling for the evacuation of the area just behind and just in front of the hospital. There was very, very heavy bombing on Khan Yunis. What I'm hearing from Palestinian colleagues is that the situation has now become so bad that they want to leave, but the situation is too dangerous for them to leave at the moment. So it's becoming a really dangerous situation for the staff that remain in that hospital, as well as all the displaced people there. And it's another uh, huge problem for healthcare in Gaza to lose another big hospital that was providing care to hundreds and hundreds of patients. And we just seem to be being pushed into a corner in the south of Gaza, in Rafah, with fewer and fewer options to provide the health care that people so desperately need.
people are dismantling greenhouses which have sort of been abandoned during the war people chopping up fences with axes just looking for anything that they can use or that they can sell and so although you see fruit and vegetables being sold they're so expensive that not many people are buying them because they need to kind of husband their money and uh, it's just not a wise choice to buy uh, so little for so much and i guess the war has been going on for so long now and people have been displaced for so long now that any sort of coping mechanism that they had at the beginning of the war any money saved up well that's probably now exhausted any sort of aid they could rely on from neighbors or families is is probably long exhausted and i think that's what sort of led to the to the to the big de desperation that that we see every day and that we continue to see with the aid convoys as soon as the the convoys come out they're mobbed by by people often quite small children it's, part of it seems to be a sort of game for them and part of it seems to be very serious and of course it's immediately very serious now because the armed people on top of those convoys Last night was really cold. I was just imagining how bad must that be for people stuck in those tents. I can't imagine how bad that night must have, have, have been for them, how awful they must be feeling.